Lester's is not coming. <laughs> no, you went to regional waste meeting. Hey, it's uh, Is she? Can you get away from Frank? How are you, Bill? Very good, thank you. Chairman of the Graduating Committee, Graduation Committee, and we are asking your permission to hold project graduation at Fort Williams like it has been done in the past few years. And it has gone over successfully for the other classes, and we'd like to con continue the tradition, and we just like your permission. Could Do you, you have tell any us questions? What's going, going to be going on? Okay, project graduation is a non alcoholic uh, <coughs> celebration for the graduates, their families, their friends, and the faculty of Cape Elizabeth High School. And it goes from 7 o'clock in, in, uh, in the evening until 10 o'clock that evening. Uh, what we do is we have dancing and a band. There is uh, non-alcoholic drinks, uh, food, things like that. There is also a fireworks display put on by L.P. Murray and the fire department has been informed about that and will be there at the fort along with the paramedics. And um, Public Works is familiar with the process and so they, it's not anything new to them. So they've also been informed at your permission. Do you generally have a good turnout? Yes, we do. We have, um, we have about 98 to 99% of the graduates 
um, participate, and as well as all their families. Uh, most of the faculty go to this um, event, support the students, and um, it is it is uh, very important to us that it's we can do this. not to be missed. That's right. By and anybody in the class of '88. That, that's right. <laughs> and it's also. Um, it's supported around the state as well as well as around the nation to have a project graduation celebration. We are continuing on after that, but this is just for the parents and the fam and uh, faculty. So, are there any questions that anybody has of Katie? Okay. <coughs> Not a question. I just think okay. that project graduation is, is something that we should all be very supportive of. Uh, I wonder what do you, what. What are you going to do after your outing at the fort? Afterwards, this is the first year that Cape Elizabeth is going to do this. We are going to continue um, at 10 o'clock, if this goes over, we would like uh, the school buses to pick all the students up directly from the fort at 10 o'clock. And we are going to be bused to a, um, the Mayor Meeting Health and Fitness Club in Topsom for, um, a, again, a non-alcoholic. Um, celebration just for the students and the faculty. It's uh, like a casino night. There's swimming. Um, there's a band. There's dancing. There's raffles. It's a. It just continues the celebration on until about five in the morning, and then the students are bused back to Cape Elizabeth. And this is new for us, but we feel that we do need to do. We do need to extend project graduation because it really was not getting its point across at the fort with just going till 11 o'clock because kids were still going out. So I hope you're having something to eat. Oh yes, plenty of food. <laughs> plenty. <laughs> Any other questions? Bill? No, I have one question that I'd like to, to the manager more than anything is. Uh, I noticed in the minutes of the, the Fort Williams committee and they granted this, but they said they're going to close the gates at 6 o'clock in order to make this available. How do you proceed to do close up the gates and not let the public in? You don't let them in, but you let what's in there out? Is that your process? That's true. Yeah, beginning around 6, there's someone at the gate, uh, usually from the Department of Public Works, usually a police officer. Uh, the class is a ticketing system. All of their uh, as friends, associates come in. Uh, the public is allowed out, but the public is not allowed in. Uh, we've done it every year in the past, and people have been ver very respectful. Uh, uh, and in fact, in many cases, appreciative of the fact that the town was doing this uh, for the high school graduating class. Okay, I agree with the process and what's going on, provided it's a non-alcoholic party, but uh, my comments were that uh, how the public reacts to not being allowed in there if it's a nice evening and what have you for the last few hours of the day. That's my point. And you don't have no problem with that and you haven't had any problem with that. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. That's all I have. Any other questions? A motion is in order. I'll move, Madam Chairman. I would move that we grant the request from the Cape Elizabeth class of 1988 to hold project graduation at Fort Williams on June 17, 1988. Second. Any further discussion? Well, I would also, you want if I could just add, I would like to, in past years, the council I know has been invited, and I would like mm -hmm. to thank you for inviting us, and I've attended several of them and had a wonderful time. They, I mean, they even let me dance and everything, so it was kind of, <laughs> it was kind of fun. Thank you for that invitation. You're welcome. I'm sure it will be extended again this year. Oh, that was a hint. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you very Thank much, you very Katie, much. for coming Thank tonight. And we hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank all of you. Thank you. <clears throat> Item 64, to consider a recommendation from the Planning Board regarding boat repair facilities. Is, is the chairman of the Planning Board not here tonight? Let me say a few words. Yes, Michael. Yeah, the uh, Mrs. Rand is returning to town uh, after vacation. Was unable to be here this evening. Uh, the planning board has been reviewing for a number of months uh, a request from Phineas Sprague 
uh, to permit a boathouse, boat repair facility uh, on some property owned by this very corporation. They do have a proposal before you tonight that they approved uh, after a public hearing and after much involvement uh, from many citizens of the community. And uh, also, like to mention that Mr. Phineas Sprague is here, as well as his attorney, uh, to provide any comments, if you'd like. Uh, actually, the ordinance that we are considering is an amendment to section 19-2-2 of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance. And these are permitted uses, correct? And are a yeah, yes. Uh, and what what the amendment is doing is adding a section P, boat repair facility, in which boats are built or repaired, provided that no more than four persons shall be engaged on a continuous basis in boat construction or repair, that no such facility shall be maintained for commercial purposes on any lot containing less than 871,200 square feet, that 300 feet front, side, and rear setbacks from any public roads or from any abutting properties be provided on the lot with the facility, that the visibility of the facility be minimized from abutting pro properties and from any public roads, that the facility not have a commercial appearance, that no outside storage of boats or materials that is visible from any public road shall be permitted, that the hours of operation shall be limited to between the hours of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m., and that site plan review and approval by the planning board shall be required. Do we have anyone from the public who wishes to speak on this ordinance, proposed ordinance? You Thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson. I'm Peter Murray, and I'm Mr. Sprague's lawyer who has uh, assisted him uh, in trying to work our way through the procedure with the, with the town. I don't have much to say since I gather that tonight's meeting uh, will be mainly an opportunity for you to receive and refer the, uh, the recommendation of the Planning Board. I'd only like to say that this proposed what is before you now is the result of a, as Mr. McGovern said, a long procedure over several months working with the planning board and the town planner. And that actually is the draft that the town planner came up with and was amended and reviewed by the planning board and uh, which uh, you now have before you. So there was that, this is the result of a lot of study and a lot of efforts to try to find something which would permit an activity in the town which I think everybody wants to have, the craftsman-like work on these boats like Mr. Sprague uh, ha has been doing, yet not in any way change uh, the uh, uh, ambiance or the atmosphere of any, any part of the town from, from the way it is. Uh, what we, uh, the reason I'm standing here though particularly is to ask uh, you, you folks if the procedures that the town uses to go forward and consider this for passage uh, could be uh, could be expedited to the extent possible. Uh, the procedure is already just for them, through no one's fault at all has gone on a long, long time and although it's no particular concern I suppose of the town, this particular activity is in danger of dying because of the fact that there is a boat that has been under restoration now for a long time. There are a couple of very skilled craftsmen who have been working on that boat. I don't know how many of you have been, have been to the farm to see this extraordinary project and this boat that is a thing of tremendous beauty being created by these craftsmen there that was. That was shut down by order of the code enforcement officer and the poor boat owner has a half-built boat and doesn't know what he's going to do. The craftsmen I've uh, been out of, uh, not working on the boat now for months, and they're in danger of leaving. And so that uh, something which literally scores of citizens came before the planning board, and I think once before this council, to support and to say that we want to have this in Cape Elizabeth is in real danger of getting snuffed out by the process. And so if there's any way that the town council were able 
to perhaps avoid a multiplicity of referrals and hearings to, to bring the issue uh, to your decision as promptly as possible, uh, we would sure appreciate and think is in the public interest. Thank you. Any questions of Mr. Murray? Yeah, my only question is, is uh, the number of 700, 871,200 square feet. Could you give us a little background on how that happened to be the number you picked up uh, that someone decided on? Or? Well, that was the, the decision of the town planner, and he, because that's 20 acres, and he felt that uh, in order to avoid any possibility that this activity could possibly impact on air in any area, that was of a denser residential nature with the houses and lots or developments and so forth, that it would only be permitted on the largest of, uh, of lots. And so he picked the, 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 that as uh, 20 acres as being what he felt would be enough so that there would be no possible chance that, uh, that it would be in an area that would be close enough where there could be any possible impact. Was there any debate on that, uh, you know, that someone wanted 10 acres or another one said 50 acres or? Was that kind of, was there a consensus built right around that the 20 acres? It, it seemed to be, uh, 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 from our particular standpoint, of course, the, the, the case with which we're concerned is on a, par a single parcel, a, a single parcel in common ownership of over 2,000 acres <coughs> and a single sort of, quote, lot of over 400 acres. And so uh, there wasn't much uh, controversy either way on that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, for our purposes, uh, it, it doesn't matter really how large it is. and. Uh, yet I suppose if you made it 2,000 acres, why well, that would make it obvious that there's only one place it could qualify. Thank you. <coughs> Can the Ordinance Committee uh, expedite Nancy? this? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Does this ordinance, uh, amendment as written apply to only existing facilities or if somebody met all these other requirements, they could build a boathouse that was not presently existing. I mean, that's the way I read. read that's it. correct. Yeah, that just uh, that would permit if anyone could hop through all of these requirements and have a 20-acre lot and have no more than four employees and be building or repairing boats and and uh, this 306 foot setbacks and on and on, uh, they could uh, they could uh, engage in that craft. And site plan review. And the site by plan approval by the planning board. Yeah. Uh, I think that is a concern that I have when it goes to the ordinance committee that that be examined whether that is really the intent that is desired that new facilities be allowed to be constructed that are not presently in existence. Also, uh, in response to your request to uh, speed up the process. I really would be opposed to doing that specifically because I think the process that we have is in place for a very good reason to safeguard against uh, having some ordinance pushed through without the proper discussion and uh, the lengthy discussion that I think is necessary. I think already the town has bent over backwards uh, in this particular matter to uh, to provide for a, a business which has been operated in a residential zone illegally for a number of years. So I really do not feel under any kind of pressure as a policymaker in town uh, to speed up the process. In fact, I think we should give the process the complete airing necessary before making a decision on something like this. Uh, could I ask Mr. Murray uh, how long this item was pending before the planning board? Well, the original decision, uh, let me see if I can find the letter of transmittal of the letter to the planning board. The original issue came up because it, originally there, it came up in November. And we at that time thought that it was a valid accessory use, that people have built boats and taken care of boats and repaired boats for each other, for themselves, uh, individually and in groups uh, for 300 years in Cape Elizabeth. The zoning board didn't agree. That was their decision. Uh, they said that this is uh, because of the fact that it's being done for someone else than the owner of the property, uh, that it therefore is not an accessory use. And so we then came back and came back with the ordinance. And it has been 
That occurred in November. And I would think it was just before or after Christmas. I think when they had a file. The ordinance was originally proposed. Well, I think it actually be proposed to this council, and then it was referred to the planning board under the under the proper procedure. So that's where it is. Maybe Mr. Yeah, it was before the zoning board before it came to the council. In addition, because of what some issues on whether or not it was a home occupation, and another issue whether or not it was as whether or not it was an accessory use. It's been kicking around a good six seven months. It was January 6th. Okay, that's correct. That's correct. Yes. I have I have a couple comments. One is that I don't believe now I'd like to ask the manager as possible that we could get the audience committee met between now and Monday night, whether this would be an item on the agenda or is it got to wait until the May meeting? The council rules state that anything has to be in the office by Wednesday noon previous to the meeting, I believe. So we've lost it by a few hours. The council, if it desires, can always take something up out of order agenda. Okay. At a regular meeting. At a regular meeting. At a regular meeting. Okay. Well, I think this has been booted around for a good long time and I am in agreement of the of the business or whatever you have been going on. I remember the farm for a good number of years and there's always been some activity down there and it's a damn shame that the place has to fall down and somebody can't use it for some other business other than farming because farming is going by the wayside. Part that bothers me as far as the audience and I got one thing for the council that I can interpret this that about the only people that can qualify this is about three or four residents of the town of Cape Elizabeth and this bothers me with the square footage that Council Hammerman brought up and I think there's other people that might like to do something like this in the future. I hate to write an ordinance and vote on an ordinance that applies to just one specific business as I'll put it. I can interpret this that I don't bring a fisherman can bring a boat in and put it in his dooryard and have anybody other than himself work on it. Now they can have four guys if it's a commercial business and I think once you get hiring somebody to work on it begins to get a little sticky as far as whether it's commercial or it's just doing a one private job. I also would like to say that I want a council feeling as far as myself is concerned whether if I act on this or work on it or any way shape or manner that do you feel I have a conflict of interest under the letter that Tom Leahy wrote that where I rent some land from the Sprague Corporation to in my farming operation would you feel that I have a conflict of interest in working on this ordinance. I feel it's for the town of Cape Elizabeth but that's up to you people to decide. I haven't talked to him specifically on my as far as I am concerned no I just read the letter and I talked to Mike McGovern a little bit about it and it's whatever the feeling of the council I would say is what I've got. I guess I'd have to ask whether you felt that you could vote negatively on this item and still feel comfortable about being able to rent your land in the future. I can act on the ordinance that don't bother me because I feel I'm enacted an ordinance for the town of Cape Elizabeth for everybody in it involved. I don't feel I'm enacted an ordinance for the Sprague Corporation or Finney Sprague specifically 
and I might need a acreage change there to satisfy myself, but I'm not going to do it to prolong the issue. But I think that is written for one place and one place only. There's about one or two others that might fit it, and I think that is wrong. And, uh, I want it very well spelled out that this doesn't interfere with anybody else if they want to repair a boat, and I don't get it that way. But I can act on it with no problem one way or the other. If I say no, I don't think they'll take the land away from me if that's what you want to know. You might want to talk to the town attorney about the uh, private citizen working on his boat or having people work on his boat, whether... I'll get that clear. He, yes. yeah, he thinks that this would prevent that. I don't read it that it would okay. myself. I think, uh, I think it, it is a difficult question that you raise, Councilor Jordan, and, and what, it, what it kind of goes to is a precedent of is, if one of us is engaged in a business relationship with something that comes before the council, and especially in this case where it does seem to be specifically tailored towards one uh, specific item, do we, should we step back? And that's where I would maybe back up what Councilor Amaro said. Wait, maybe we do need advice from the town attorney on this. There, I could see it either way. To me, it's a real close call. If I'm involved in a business relationship with someone and they come before the council, and, and it's obviously going to affect my, it could affect my business somehow. It's, it's a, te it's a tough situation to be put in, you know. To, so I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't really know the, the law on that or, or whatever. But we might, you might want to seek counsel from, Mr. Leahy. What, I don't know. What do other counselors think of? Well, I'm the only one that doesn't, the the only one that doesn't say anything about this. And I, I guess I don't have a real problem with this, provided uh, the lease negotiations for your land isn't still pending. And uh, should your vote to change that arrangement, I would be my own concern. If you're locked into a certain lease arrangement for, for some time, and it's been historical, and it doesn't plan to change in the near future, I wouldn't worry about it. I don't know what the status is, and I think legal counsel would be able to advise it. Personally, I'm not concerned about it. I think I can act on it, but I don't want anybody to feel that I am uh, creating a um, conflict of interest here. Would it be appropriate for the manager to consult with the town attorney on this? Yeah, I think it also on the question of whether uh, this proposed ordinance uh, does prevent uh, private parties from having skilled workers working on their boat on their property. Michael? If the council would like to be happy. I would. Councilor Jordan? I, I would just like to say, I think the letter that you have in your packet for um, the town attorney spells it out pretty well, and I think that he wouldn't have much more to add to it as far as the conflict goes it would be. But as far as the interpretation, yes, I think that should be cleared up before it comes back, before the council to vote on. Michael? Hey, I really didn't want to inject myself in the, in the conversation. Uh, the, I have discussed it with the town attorney, and uh, his conclusion was, in essence, that Councillor William Jordan should disclose that he did have a contractual arrangement with the Spray Corporation. Uh, he should indicate whether or not he felt he had a bias. And uh, as, in, as in other issues of, conflict of conflicts of interest, it's been the tradition of this council that the council uh, <coughs> judge whether or not they felt that a conflict existed. If you'd like more specific guidance from the town attorney, uh, I'm sure you'd be happy to provide it. Well, we do have this other question, too, that Councilor Jordan has raised. A motion is in order. I'm going to refer this to the Ordinance Committee. Madam Chairman. Uh, I would move that we uh, take the recommendations from the planning board on this issue and move them to the ordinance committee. Second. Second. Any further discussion? 
The only further discussion, I guess, would be in my part of having been chairman of the Ordinance Committee for two and a half years is that just to explain again to the general public that the, the normal procedure, general procedure, is it goes to the Ordinance Committee, they will recommend back to the council that will then set a date for a public hearing. At that same date where the public hearing is, we, we will usually have it on the agenda and it can be approved that night. Uh, the only way that we could possibly expedite it, and which I tried to do sometimes as chairman, was to call together the Ordinance Committee as quickly as possible so we could get it onto the agenda. However, I, I'm sure everyone realizes that we are constrained by the ordinances of this town, which have been deliberated upon, and, and, and these are the laws that we have to live with. So we'll do certainly all that we can within the law, but that's the procedure that we follow. So I just wanted to clarify that for everyone here and, and the people at home. You ready for the vote? All those in favor of the motion, opposed, it's in your motion. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Item 65. To consider the adoption of Sperling Church rules for 1988. Michael? You have before you the no. Spurwing Church rules, uh, we have, whenever you rent out a, a building to the public, uh, particularly when you're government bureaucracy, you need to uh, have certain rules. Uh, the rules set forth the rates, uh, what's allowed, what isn't. In the past, they've been significant, particularly, they've been significantly reviewed by the Board of Historic Preservation Advisors, particularly in terms of appropriate use of the church. Uh, these particular provisions that you have before you there are a number of changes. One is that if someone cancels a church reservation, they would have to forfeit the security deposit. We've had increasing numbers of church cancellations. We have had two this week alone. Uh, well, folks, for one reason or another, decided they didn't want the church. What happens is one of the dates, I think was June 11th, you know, very much prime time, and other people are, are denied the use of the church, and also the, the revenue is foregone. Uh, at the, at the very least, uh, the person who handles the church, who is Barbara Ray, the reservations of it, and myself feel that we should uh, ask whoever makes the cancellation to forfeit the security deposit. The other change is that the dates of the church were uh, May 1st to October 1st. We have looked quite a bit at the calendar. We spoke to Jane Greer, who was the church greeter last year. She said it can get very, very cold in the church in early May. Uh, we have not taken any reservations this year uh, because of her concern, because we had many, many complaints about the church being cold until May 15th. We'd like the provisions for use to formalize that. In October, it, it does seem to stay warmer as well. I think people have kind of adapted uh, to the weather, uh, perhaps a little bit different. I'm not sure why they would. It doesn't make much sense, but uh, we don't get as many complaints uh, about the cool weather uh, at that time of year as we do uh, during the early spring. Uh, those are the only changes and would recommend you adopt the provisions for use of the Spurwing Church uh, and that they remain in effect in 1988 and, and until amended by the Town Council. So moved. Oh, we got a question. I'll second the motion and I'll ask a question. I would I would just like to say to the manager one reason in the fall that the church seems to be warmer is the material inside during the summer has got warmed up and it takes it longer to cool off and this time of year it takes it longer to get warm up because of the dampness and the coldness so I can understand why they could go into October my question is if you keep I'm not in a disagreement keeping you 50 bucks but you picked out a prime date here I think if somebody come and took that date that somebody canceled out with, you should give them back the 50 bucks that you hold. That's just one of my opinions. I don't believe in uh, gouging the people. And I think if I had a deposit there of 50 bucks and you didn't use it and you couldn't use it, okay, I'll agree with that. But if Joe Smith come along and wanted that date afterwards, I don't think you should get his rental and take my deposit too. Uh, my other question is uh, the uh, request for an extra opening may be honored by an extra 10 bucks. When you say an opening, what do you mean? If somebody just wants to go over and look at it? Uh, what, what is uh, That's unclear to me. Yeah, what, what we have is we have a number of times that we 
tell people the church is open if they want to see it. We always have a Saturday before the season that we send a letter out to everyone who's reserved it saying, if you want to drop by the church, it will be open. We don't charge for that. We also tell people when other weddings are scheduled, if they want to go in the church to look at for flowers, that type of thing. What was happening is we were getting people that wanted to come over with their florists, with their pant, with their organists, with five or six people, and you know, we just don't have people available to run over to the church all the time. What we wanted to do was to have a way that uh, people, if Ket came in at an odd time, that they would be compensated for it, as, as well as to discourage it and to encourage them to use the times that are available. But that's when the church has to be unlocked, and we just can't give someone a key and go over themselves because there's a security system. Uh, we are concerned for the safety of the church. Okay. Now, the the other question just cleared my mind. They have to make, they have to pay for the church up front, and they also have to give you a deposit. That's correct. Is that correct? Now, in in the other one that it follows here, that uh, I guess are the old rules, which once we adopt these front ones, you don't go by the, the old ones are canceled out. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, well then my other question is, is I couldn't quite understand in your old rules that they give $50 and you had to check it for damages and if it's okay, but then it says, or lack of damages, and that's what I didn't quite understand. If we don't find any damage, they get the whole security deposit back. Okay. I thought you were looking for no. somebody to do some damage, that's why no. I didn't tell you. I don't know who came up with that one. <laughs> okay. I'll let you know I read my mail. I learned something. Uh, that some people throw bird seed at brides. <laughs> I never heard of that. Because you can't throw confetti or anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a motion on the floor. And I second, second it. Yeah. Any further? Uh, Councilor Tinsley. Yeah, I have two basic comments on the uh, parallel bill's thoughts. Uh, about the damage or the $50 security deposit, which is held in case there's any damage, uh, not knowing what the contract looks like or how it's discussed, is there language in that contract that states the $50 will be used if there's damage and should be held for that purpose? Whenever anyone reserves the church, they receive a copy of these rules. Okay, my concern is if we limit the damage clause to a $50 security deposit, should there be $1,000 worth of damage, that may be a disclaimer in the limit of our liability, and I would just ask that that be checked out, because I know in other contracts, uh, if there's specific terms mentioned, that's the basic limit of your, of your uh, obligation. And the other part is the, uh, the cancellation clause. You know, I think, like Bill, if the church is going to be used by some other party and the cancellation is given with, with uh, sufficient notice that the $50 <coughs> ought to be refunded. And I know it, it causes a procedural backlog perhaps and a, and a little bit more work for Barbara, but uh, I would just hate to keep the $50 if it could be uh, re-rented and uh, set up again or perhaps just to change a date or something, try to accommodate the users. I, that's a tough time in anyone's life, and um, you know the 50 bucks could be important. I don't think the town needs it, but I don't know how that's worked out. No. Could save someone a lifetime yeah. of hassle, too. <laughs> They're making the wrong decision. Uh, Cheap enough, huh? Yeah, you know, good I, way out. I can't say we incur $50 worth of expenditures, but when when we do reserve the, the when we return the rental fee and the full security deposit. We ha we are printing checks which cost us several dollars to prepare. If you if you look at studies, what it costs to prepare a check, uh, we've received the funds, deposited them. It, it Barbara's time. It all adds up. It uh, you know I, I would guess you know we're probably out ten bucks, not fifty, but there is a cost. Well, particularly with postage checks, we're quarter now. It's, I guess, from a facility manager's interjection here, it's, it's very common to have non-refundable deposits. And I understand with citizenry if it, if it is rented, but there are expenses that are incurred. And most times you're holding the date and, and you're just not offering it to so many people. You know, dozens and dozens of people Michael won't offer that date to because thinking that. So, so there's, there's some administrative time there. I don't, 
I don't really have a strong feeling one way or the other. It's, it's an industry standard. I don't have very often that I can comment on my <laughs> industry, so I definitely wanted to comment on that. <laughs> well, I, I am still against it, and it's more of a policy deal, I would think, than uh, something that you should write in here. I don't know. And I would think the town would be able to refund that 50 bucks if, uh, without too much cost. I'll admit that it's probably some. You get some cost of writing a check and this one doing that and doing something else. But I think it would be a great service to the people that rented it and put up the deposit that if you rented it to somebody else that uh, they sh you should be able to refund their deposit. These, these are burning issues. <laughs> There's some water. Don't, uh, you know. don't feel very strong. Uh, if, if, if indeed, as Council Victoria has stated, this is a, uh, an industry standard, um, I'm sure that the Historic Preservation Commission has passed this over, um, and these are their recommendations. And I really don't feel very strongly about removing the system of uh, holding myself. How do you feel, Councilor Ramon? I feel exactly the same way as you do. Uh, I think that our charges for using the Spurwing Church are minimal to begin with. And uh, if, if somebody puts a $50 deposit down and then backs out, they have, uh, I think that's a, a small amount to pay for, for holding that church and, and uh, keeping other people from having uh, the right to use it. So I, uh, I can't get excited about the town keeping a $50 deposit because I think a lot of other people have been inconvenienced in the meantime and it's a very small amount to ask for. So I guess I have not been convinced that we should <laughs> change the recommendation that is before us tonight. If I may, I'll make one more plea and shut up. <laughs> I'm liable to vote against it, but anyway. Uh, I don't look at the historical Spruing Church as a business like the Civic Center or the Expo. And I think there's a lot of tickets that go out for sale, and I don't think they charge the people to come in and see a wedding. And I think anybody in getting married and like to use that historical place spend enough money so I think the town isn't that hard up that they couldn't send the 50 bucks back if the place was used again. That's all I'll say. Are we ready for the vote? We're not voting on this particular item that we've been discussing. We're voting on the whole rules, all of the rules. But if you don't agree with part of the rules, you have to vote against the whole thing, <laughs> which is what I'm dissatisfied with. Well, you could offer an amendment to the rules. <clears throat> Doesn't matter. You could offer an amendment if you want. Would you so... You want to make what? I'll make a we'll motion. Okay. Uh, I'll make a motion, an amendment to these rules here, but that if a deposit, security deposit, has been put down for a specific date and they cancel out and someone else comes along and would like to use that date that the $50 deposit be sent back to the first, first one that, uh, I don't know just how you would say but that. But only in that case. But only in that case, that's right. Otherwise, if they don't, if nobody takes it, they don't send it back. But if somebody comes in and wants that date, I feel they should send it back. Any Jeez. discussion? Was there a second? Ready? Is there a second? Second. Any discussion now? Ready for the vote? All those in favor of the motion? The amendment. Oh, the amendment, yes. This is the amendment. Three to two. All right, now we'll vote on the main motion. Uh, we didn't vote. <laughs> are the rules themselves? Are you ready for the vote? Yep. I think we're all, all ready. All votes in favor 
of the rules as they stand. Opposed? That's opposed. One, two, three, two. Okay. Let's go to the Madam Chairman, members of the Council, good evening. My name is Edward Drynan. I live on Mitchell Road. I've been a resident of Cape Elizabeth for 13 years. And before we get uh, going any further on this, I just wanted to ask the uh, Council if they heard what I heard from the representative of the class of 88. Did I hear her say that parents are invited to graduation day? If so, as a parent of a member of that class, it is news to me. <laughs> Good for you. It's not, it's not binding either. <laughs> <laughs> Only those binding tonight are invited. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm here tonight to uh, request an extension of the sewer line to a 25-acre parcel of land which I own in Cape Elizabeth. It's in the northern portion of the Cape. I've submitted background information to you, and I'll summarize it just briefly. The land is indicated on a uh, zoning map of the town, which I enclosed on one of the back pages of this briefing paper. The land in question is actually surrounded, it's an orange area surrounded by green, <coughs> and it is in the northern part of the Cape, serviced by the contract which we have with the city of South Portland. By way of background, uh, prospective purchases of the land have been told by the building inspector that sewer connections to that land can only be made to the extent that there are 100 foot lengths of road frontage existing presently on the land. In other words, if you own a half acre lot with 100 feet of road frontage, you may make a one sewer connection to it. If you own a 100-acre lot with a 100 feet of frontage, you may make one sewer connection to it. This uh, ordinance, uh, section of the ordinance, says that if new streets are constructed on that large parcel of land to town specifications with the appropriate street frontage and the appropriate size lot, in the uh, example I just gave, only one sewer connection can be made. I'd like you to uh, rule on this based upon the uh, following. Uh, I've indicated in my letter to you the section of the ordinance which restricts new connections to that land. I've also indicated the section of the ordinance which gives you, the council, the authority to grant an extension. A part of your ability to grant an extension uh, <coughs> is determined upon you receiving from the town engineer documentation that the increased flow is within our contract limits with the city of South Portland. To that end, I have attached also to this paper a study by the engineers of land use consultants which addresses the flow issue of the sewage in the Northern Cape system into South Portland. These figures that I have presented to you are from the Portland Water District, and they represent the flow data for a two-year period, the most recent two-year period available. In summary, it says that we have a contract with South Portland to put in up to 500,000 gallons per day of sewage. And in the last two years, we have averaged 386,000 gallons per day and 385,000 gallons per day, which is 77% of our contracted capacity. 
My request to you was going to be for <clears throat> no more than 39 new connections, or about 10,000 gallons a day, or about a 2% increase in the present flow, taking it from 77% to 79%. Part of the consideration of this increase should be that just a year ago at this time, the state of Maine experienced massive flooding <clears throat> from heavy rainfall and simultaneous snow melt. At that time, there was considerable infiltration of this sewer system. And even with that massive 100-year storm standard and the infiltration that resulted from it, we never exceeded our contract capacity with South Portland. I believe that the uh, proposed uh, increase for these lots are clearly within the established guidelines that we have. I've been very reluctant to appear here before you because it, uh, I think, may portray me as a developer of land, which I am not, nor am I an agent or a representative of any developer. I do consider myself to be a responsible landowner and a responsible citizen of Cape Elizabeth. In the past, I have had, uh, presently I do have, and in the future I anticipate having land which is suitable for development, which I will be selling. I have a demonstrated track record of maintaining control over any land which I sell to a developer. Some of the aspects of control which I've insisted on maintaining are that the uh, proposed development cannot come close to the maximum development allowed by zoning regulation. The proposed development must leave open space. It must be sensitive to environmental uh, concerns and it must be sensitive to the needs of the uh, immediate neighborhood. I pointed out three specific examples of that in my letter to you. Now tonight I have uh, what I consider to be a typical example of a development proposal which I have received for this land. I'd like to show it to you, it will only take a minute. received a proposal, and it is a proposal only, which I like, and I think deserves your merit, and I'd like you to consider it. The same piece of land, with some striking differences. 
This concept, as you can see, leaves more than half of the land as open space in its natural state as it exists today. I think it is environmentally sensitive. It protects a small brook and meadowland here which serves as a drainage from a maximum farm right here. It leaves as open space an area of town which has a beautiful mature red pine forest up in here. There's ample public access for this town on the lot. And very importantly to me, it protects, I think, the interests of the existing houses and neighborhoods. There are houses all along here, and there are houses similar to this on this lot along Sperling Ave. In my opinion, this sort of a concept will not be visible from any of the existing houses or neighborhoods. Additionally, all of the land in excess of the 19.9 acres or so that uh, will be donated uh, outright uh, to the town by this developer. The developer, by the way, is Crest Development. They're presently familiar with it, perhaps, because they're constructing Canterbury. They invited me to look at Canterbury. I've been pleased with it. I've been pleased with the uh, 50 acres or so of dedicated uh, land for nature and conservation purposes that have been set aside from the Canterbury project. I found them to be uh, quality people of integrity. I am not a representative of Crest by any means, and uh, but they have presented me with a proposal which I like and one which I would like to see this town go forward with. It definitely requires an extension of the sewer. I have. In my tentative discussions with Chris, limited them to seeking no more than 39 units here, even though zoning allows for more. Even if the planning board were to grant more by contract with me, I would not allow it. So in conclusion then, I'd like to say that you have the authority to grant an extension of the sewer. The capacity for such a, an extension is clearly there, and uh, I think this is a uh, responsible and uh, sensitive development proposal. And I urge you to uh, move to uh, accept my petition. Thank you. Any questions, Mr. Connor? Michael? Just one comment. You, you do have a Board of Sewer Appeals, which also has a responsibility for advising on sewer issues. Uh, that committee has recently been reconstituted, has some new members. Uh, yeah, I think it, you might like to consider them as a, as a possible uh, uh, committee or board to refer this to. We also do not have in hand the required uh, certification or whatever from the town engineer at this time stating that there is capacity. Uh, we are uh, undergoing infiltration reduction, reduction programs uh, in the northern end. Uh, citizens have been very cooperative in removing roof drains. This has been a severe problem down in Maiden Cove, which we hope to fix sometime in the next month. Uh, but it's still, you know, sketchy whether or not there is capacity. Mr. Drynan uh, cites 77 uh, percent is being utilized. However, back when the current policy was adopted uh, pending before the planning board uh, were developments including Cape Wood, Stone Gates, uh, additional units in various other areas, the Canterbury by the Cape proposal, uh, Hubstone still has another 50 units to go on. It's, it's quite a detailed uh, computation on whether or not there is in fact capacity and something that probably the Board of Sewer Appeal should study uh, more closely with the advice of the town attorney. Mr. Dryan, uh, does this developer, the one that you like, have an option on your land? No, he does not. It's a proposal and it's in the discussion stage. I would prefer to enter into an arrangement with a man. I would like to. I like his proposal. I was wondering why the developer didn't come forward rather than you, but obviously he doesn't he, have an He has no, I guess they call it standing at this point. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have a question, Mr. Dryden, but I do have a question to the council. Uh, you know, I, I realize what we enacted here with our ordinances pertaining to the sewers, 
but it was never my intent that a proposal come before the town council and for the town council to become a uh, not a co-conspirator but a co-planner of a development based on sewer capacity I mean we are the tail wag and the dog and it would appear to me that section 15-1-7b would which pertain to existing communities or existing neighborhoods that as a neighborhood would petition the town council because they no longer need subdivision review by the planning board and that for reasons petitioned for that they would try to base their argument on their need plus the ability for the uh, treatment plant to take their uh, their product uh, you know I think the council is getting into a, a real touchy position here reviewing plans and pretty much in, in trying to endorse a plan that's not been before the planning board. Uh, the planning board is the body that reviews subdivisions, would make their recommendations for density and, and the type of uh, community that uh, may or may not be good for the town. And I would think through that process, it may in fact come back to the council based on how I interpret this. If the planning board thought in order to extend the sewer they needed council participation or endorsement. But I think, and I can understand your confusion in reading it too, because it clearly wasn't my intent that we get into this posture. And if we are getting into this posture, maybe we ought to look at this at the ordinances again, because I I, I think we're confusing the whole issue with subdivision review here. And uh, May I uh, uh, make a comment to that? Sure. And to Mr. McGovern's? Uh, regarding Mr. McGovern's comment, first of all, the, uh, the figures, uh, I realize, have not been certified to you by the town engineer. They are, however, pulled from the only source available, the Portland Water District, and they are irrefutable. A copy of the uh, land use consultants, which are responsible uh, engineering firm, has gone to the uh, town engineer. Uh, Mr. McGovern suggested perhaps the uh, correct uh, review board for this uh, would be the Sewer Appeals Board. There is no provision uh, in the Sewer Ordinance for the Sewer Appeals Board to grant this extension. The Sewer Appeals Board can only interpret the ordinance, in uh, my opinion. And uh, regarding Mr. Pinsman's comment, I agree with you. This board should not function as a planning board. And I am not asking for approval of one plan versus another. I'm basically here to say that the uh, capacity for the sewer allows an increase. And as a matter of fact, even with this uh, additional uh, units uh, approved, there is still, according to the numbers available, 100,000 gallons per day, which is equivalent to an additional 400 houses in the North Cape system. Uh, you know as well as I do that there was probably not enough land in the Northern Cape to build 400 houses on, let alone service them with the uh, sewer. I think there is adequate and plentiful uh, capacity here. Uh, I would, as I said uh, earlier, uh, Mr. Tinsman, I preferred not to have presented this here, but it was the uh, only town body available to make a decision. Councilor Jordan. I, I would just like to say, I thought as I read the item on the agenda, it was more for us to decide whether they could sewer that area or they couldn't sewer it before they went to the planning board. Now, have I misunderstood the the item? Now, I agree with you, Councilor Tisman, that uh, the planning board is the one that should decide on either one of those projects and, and what should be done there. But then, if it went to the planning board and they decided that they wanted such and such and so many houses in there, so many units in there, then would it come back to the council? Would that be the proper process for it to come back to the council? If they said, no, you can't sew it, and the council could say, yes, you can sew it, shouldn't it be going that direction to decide whether it would be allowed to be sewered or not? I think it's a council decision of whether you allow to sewer it or not, if the capacity is there. If, if I may, Madam Chairman, I think this, uh, a parallel exists with the ability to sewer this as it would be with the road construction. I mean, the council sets forth a, a process for 
developments and the type of roads that would be acceptable by the council. It is still a process that goes through the planning board. The roads are built to town standards as this proposal, I, assure, I would assume, would go to the engineers to get capacity, reserve capacity. If there exists enough capacity, then the planning board would recommend back to the council, I would assume, as they would acceptance of a road, the ability to sewer. And, and that's how I interpret this provision of the ordinance, and, and I may be wrong. But. Go ahead, Madam Chairman. Can I help muddy no, the waters no, a little bit? No. I, just from my perspective on the whole background, which is fairly deep, you know, just three, three and a half years into it, but there's been certainly a lot of meetings regarding it. I thought, and maybe I'm just voicing to get some opinions, that the sewer, kind of the, the sewer board of appeal, the sewer appeals board, kind of replace what our sewer advisory used to be. So we're sending things to them. That's always been the intent. We phased out the sewer advisory, yet we as a council always felt we still needed a body to advise us, to keep the overview of the whole infiltration situation. To advise. So it seems to me appropriate to send it to them, let them mull it over, look the big picture over, give us some advice, and then we make a decision, at which point he would then have the okay or not to go to the planning board. I mean, he, at least he has that okay as to whether we felt it would be sewered or not. He would then progress with that in hand to the planning board. It makes more sense than going to the planning board not knowing whether we're even going to okay the sewer. So that's that's my historical background that I've gone out of the last three years of what where we're at now so and where we should go. You, you did, in fact, amend the sewerage ordinance to provide the Board of Sewer Appeals would be advisory. Right. That's what I So I, I'd like to go that route. Well, do we have a motion to that effect? I got one more point. I can't see sending that to the Sewer Appeals Board and to find out what they're going to accomplish if they don't know how many units it's going to be approved there by the Planning Board. This is my point. The Planning Board might say, you know, and put 10 in there, and they might look for whether there's a capacity of 50 or 30. So I think it needs Planning Board approval before you can make a decision of how many units are going to be serviced by that. And this is why I say I think he should have plan board approval. And maybe they would say, what if their plan board says, okay, you can sewer it? Then does it get to go to the board of appeal, or the sewer board of appeals to get an okay before it comes to the council? Michael. I, 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 you know, I understand the questions and the concern. Uh, I think the, the problem is it, it just costs so much money through the planning board process. You, you, people who are looking to develop property uh, are looking for an indication early on whether or not they ought to do it based on sewer or based on, on septic system. I was speaking to one developer uh, doing a uh, eight lot subdivision and still does not have planning board approval and has spent over $90,000 on the review process so far, uh, 12000 per lot. So. You know, I, there is, uh, you know, as much as the process seems convoluted, uh, you know, I, I can understand, you know, if, if anyone's to, to build a home in Cape Elizabeth, uh, they've got to know what the rules are. But, but is it, the, the only thing is, is it convoluted if Mr. Drynan went in saying that he wanted 39 units or less? That, that doesn't seem convoluted to me, and he seems to have hit upon a number, even if it was 50, or he said that he could do maximum 52, but he's more interested in 39. It's it's not as nebulous, I don't think, as as it's being made out to be. It's a fairly more specific. Granted, it makes a difference, but I'm just I'm just looking for the process. I'm certainly not arguing one way or the other. I just think that if, if it was a difference between 25 and 225, then you're talking way out. But this is kind of in, in a ballpark where you'd say this or less than this. Can I utilize my land in that way? In fact, we have a letter from Mr. Dryden requesting. Uh, so, uh, so many units set aside, uh, the sewer superintendent received it, uh, the public works director denied it, except for two connections uh, for the entire parcel. Uh, so, you know, there is a basis for uh, moving forward, forward without a specific plan. At the very least, I would think that the, the uh, sewer board of appeals would be able to advise us on um, on the remaining capacity uh, with the pending uh, uh, application <coughs> that Michael mentioned. Uh, some of them are 
probably still pending. Some are not. From and so we need to really have some firm figures, I would think, as to the remaining capacity in the South Port of Plan. Council Judge? Yes, Madam Chairman, I agree with you 100%, but I don't want you to feel I don't want to get that other board some work to do. But the other board, all they're going to do is get your town engineer or somebody and get you the figures that you're talking about, which I say the council or the manager could get them, if that's all we're after. I, I think there are some other policy issues, much as you're going through with the Southern Cape system and putting certain numbers in the ordinance. How much do you want to reserve for infiltration? How much do you want to reserve for other purposes? And there's, there's quite a bit of thinking that that needs to be made to this issue. You know, Mr. Drynan may be just looking for 2%, but there's a, there's a much larger issue if this one comes in. Uh, you know, there's a nickel and dime in the remaining capacity, uh, if in fact there is any, that you need to set a, an allocation system for. Certainly it seems to me that uh, we're in no position to make a decision on this tonight, whether or not we refer to the to the, zone, uh, to the uh, sewer board of appeals. There are too many balls up in the air. Too many questions. Madam Chairman? Yeah. Yes. I uh, should say I don't, I, I did not expect a decision forthcoming tonight from the council. I anticipated a course of action pretty much like the council of Latoria had spelled out. Uh, you would uh, send this and I would like to be able to make the presentation if I can to the whatever it is called, either the Sewer Appeals Board and or the Sewer Advisory Committee. I, I, I know that the Appeals Board, as it stood, was not able to make this decision. However, the Appeals yeah. Board slash Advisory Committee is certainly in a position to uh, mull over the matter and report back to you with all of these other considerations. How much, what is the potential development in the area, what actually is being requested here, and so forth. And uh, that's sort of the route I expected this to take, and I, when a report does come back from the advisory committee, uh, only then would I hope for, for some action by the council. I'd like to say that uh, my uh, agreement, which I will enter into, uh, if possible, with this particular developer, will say that no matter what the planning board tells you, I will not allow you to build more than 39 units there. The planning board, as we know, is very thorough in its review process, and very likely we'll say that perhaps 39 can't be built, maybe it's only going to be 25. But in any event, the developer and I believe the planning board must know that <clears throat> what is contemplated on that site will be sewered or not sewered. I think the issue is to resolve the sewer issue first, and I do believe the way it should go is <clears throat> by your referral to the advisory committee, then back to you. Do I hear a motion? Councilor Emma. No, I just just wanted to bring up another policy issue because I I think I'm remembering correctly that when these policies were drawn up regarding new sewer connections after the southern sewer went into existence, that the purpose of all of these was to safeguard against new developments going on to the sewer. That the purpose was to service existing built up areas and fill in growth. And that's why the, uh, the frontage on the street or the frontage on the sewer was put on there. Now this, this to me creates a uh, kind of a, a problem in how to look at this because here, here we have two proposals, one of which is certainly much more desirable uh, in that more land is left open in town uh, and not all used up as it would be in uh, the first the first plan here, but but I do think as a matter of policy that that has to be addressed also, because when when this whole item went out to referendum, uh, <coughs> the intent was that the sewer would serve as existing problem areas, existing needs, and fill in growth only, fill in growth as defined later on in this ordinance. And Jim? Our uh, council will too. But wouldn't, wouldn't still, let's say, yeah, again, we're just talking in, in pure theory here, but wouldn't that, isn't that what the sewer advisory board might rec might recommend back to us? That's, that's what, see, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So the process right. certainly 
we don't want to prejudice them in any way, but no. that might be one of the things that they come back saying. Because certainly I have completely different recollections about what our town engineer told us regarding how close we were getting to our okay. South Portland contractual obligations. I won't enter into a big discussion on that now, but we had a joint meeting where that was clearly spelled out to the point where we actually had an emergency moratorium on no more multiplex housing because we were told time and again that we were dangerously close to the limit, if not at the limit, if not ready to exceed the limit of our contractual obligations. We made some very important decisions as, as this council enacting emergency legislation, being told by the town engineer some very different information than's coming here tonight. So, but I don't want to have a full-scale debate on that tonight. I think that is a good forum, and then once they bring us recommendations, then we can have a, a much fuller debate on it. I have a question of the manager. Michael, um, wasn't that policy about, that Jane mentioned, about boosting development and fill-in growth didn't that apply to the Southern Cape sewer system? No. Tell me. Uh, right. And we know that there are other existing areas in town that are going to need sewer. Uh, that that their problems are not that severe now, but that we know down the road they will. And so we have to think about that too. So. Yeah. There are a lot of issues, and I, I would, li I personally would like to see it sent to. The uh, sewer appeals. Do you want to make the motion? Yes, yeah, and I would move that we send this item to the sewer appeals board for an advisory opinion. I'll, uh, on the I'll second that with a comment. I would like to comment on what Councilor Amaro just said, and with some people, and I'll admit it wasn't a majority, it's probably a minority, that on that part as far as you take a parcel of land and you can only hook one that's next to the road into the, the sewer, so the rest of it's going to go into a leaching field. And I don't think the people understood that. And I know some people that didn't understand it. And they felt if a parcel of land butted the road that the whole parcel would go into it. But when it was adopted, and I think, and I'll say, and I'll stay to the day I die, it was a damn big mistake to pollute the part of part back of your land and to sewer the front part. And I would hope this council would grab a hold of that someday and straighten it out. Either not allow it at all or let it all be sewered. And I don't think that's a f right way of looking at it. We're just going in Cape Elizabeth here and polluting the ground right and left when we've got sewers here that nobody wants to allow them to hook into and I think it's wrong. Well, we have a motion and a second. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. And I want to welcome uh, uh, Councillor Carson, who was off on some other chore duty tonight. There's a meeting tentatively scheduled, I believe it's for the 21st of this month. We'll be sending notices out to the board members and if we get back from them, but it will be in the board again. Maybe that night. Thank you very much. And yes, you will be able to present to them. What the? You will be able to present to them. Thank you. Item 67, to consider the status of town council rules. Michael? You asked the town attorney to draft up uh, a number of proposed rule changes based on a, a conversation you had at a previous meeting, or a discussion at a previous meeting. Uh, he has submitted uh, those along with some comments, and uh, it's before you tonight for whatever you wish to do with them. Do you have any reactions to the proposal? The one that the town council rules? Chairman? Oh, no. uh, Council, okay. oh I, I just wanted to state that uh, I, I had some strong favoring feelings about changing section 16, but I'm going to drop my 
rather one-hour speech that I was going to give on that. But I would, uh, moving on to number two, I, I think parliamentary procedures is we should, we should add. I'm still in favor of deleting shall be decided without debate, but I feel it might take us out of sync with other, you know, standard accepted nationally uh, rules. So I'm not going to, even though I feel I was standing on very, very strong ground on that one. I'm, I'm deferring, especially when I thought I was going to lose six to one. <laughs> But, uh, but I would like to see number two certainly passed by us. This is adding Robert's Rules of Order. Adding Robert's uh, Rules of Order. In case our own rules don't cover this situation. I definitely would like I to agree. see that uh, included. What about uh, number three, uh, to allow any member to move for reconsideration of a matter, not just one on the prevailing side? Uh, Council Madam Chairman, I would like to see any member be able to move for reconsideration. And one of the one of the strongest examples for that for me is if it's a, it is a three to three vote, and the the nays have it, meaning that it didn't pass, and there was a fourth councilor absent. Why the people on the on the pro side couldn't ask for a reconsideration to me, just isn't. To me, it just doesn't make any sense. There's not there's not a sense of fairness about that. So I don't see, I think it can be abused, like any rule can be abused, where uh, the people on, on the non-prevailing side could keep bringing it up and bringing it up, but I don't think neither the council nor the citizens would tolerate that type of abuse. So I think it's, it's just a fair thing where anyone can bring up a reconsideration as long as it's not a rule that's, that's abused. But what specifically bothers me is in the case of a tie, that only um, those, you know, that, that those that were for it couldn't get a chance to bring it up again. Only one side could bring it up in the case of a tie if a fourth counselor was absent. Uh, the, uh, the prevailing the side could be against. has made a point members. of explaining that, that, that the, reason, the reason for this particular uh, item on reconsideration is to prevent the minority from taking over the majority rule and dragging things out and filibustering and et cetera. That's, and that's, I, I would that's just, the reason. Yeah, I would just say in response that any rule that we set can be abused by a group that wants to abuse a rule. You could even abuse a tabling rule where two people could conspire. Table second, that's the end of the discussion, even though they knew someone else had some really strong discussions which they didn't want that person to give. Any rule here can be manipulated and abused. All I'm saying is in specifically the case of a three to three vote where the fourth counselor was absolutely just could not get to the meeting and yet was in favor of something, meaning that the four to three, the, the seven elected officers were actually in favor of it, but he couldn't come to the meeting. The people on the non-prevailing side couldn't bring it up again, even though they may have had a, a fourth vote in their favor. So it, to me, this, specifically the tie is what bothers me. Couldn't we add language just to address that one particular that, that don't, uh, that problem? Don't have a good tie we could, we could add language, and I thought while we were doing that, we could add language <laughs> to include. <laughs> yeah, that would be all so easy. I, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not opposed to having, you know, people in the minority be able to bring it up again, because I just don't think, you know, you may come across some new information, you may, as long as it's done on the up and up, and it's not abused, there's nothing wrong with that. I may have uncovered and un unearthed another very important fact that I wanted to bring. But in the spirit of fair play, uh, the minority, ought to be convinced <coughs> the person who wants a reconsideration ought to be uh, persuading the other side of the validity and merit of his case or her case. See what I mean? Oh, you mean they do live in <coughs> majority rule. I mean, mm -hmm. That's the way our government is run. I just don't see anything wrong with it. That's my, that's my opinion. And, and having the minority bring it up again, if they've unearthed some new information, or as long as that rule is not abused. I'm certainly strongly in favor of it, in case of a tie, that either side can bring it up for reconsideration. And I would hope that we could also have it, even if it wasn't a tie. Frank, if, if your idea is such a good one, why did Mr. Roberts include it in his rules? He who... No one's perfect. <laughs> no one's perfect. <laughs> All of these intricacies of... <laughs> Probably this is a time of great change throughout our country. <laughs> I don't know. What can I say? It wasn't handed down from Moses, I guess. 
I'm, uh, Council of Jordan? I'm in favor of Frank's idea as far as a tie goes, but not in favor of it as far as the minority goes. I think it should stay according to the Roberts rules as far as a minority vote. But if the tie, I agree with what he's saying. You come in on a 3-3 tie, somebody was absent. I think it has some validity there. One should never be absent. Well, that's true. Council <laughs> Tenson. Uh, I have, thank you. I agree with Frank's on, on section 17. I think it's 17. So, uh, that's in a tie vote. Anybody should be able to uh, bring that back up on, on section 16, though. The portion that was asked to be deleted shall not shall be decided without debate. Did not only apply in that particular section, but applied throughout some other the council rules. And my concern with the ability to pass something without debate was that people may not even understand what the what the motion implies and whether or not the subject of that motion could be debated, I'm not in favor of. But I think to what extent that motion has, and the, and the cause and the effect of that motion, ought to be able to be questioned. And that's what I asked the attorney, because other communities do have the right to question what that particular motion will do. And I think the town, this board, ought to be able to question what, in fact, the motion has for an effect and, and I think that portion of the question in a tabling motion or in a motion to adjourn or to to whatever the other sections are, and maybe I haven't presented that very clearly, but I tried to present it to the attorney the night we discussed it. May I answer that? If there is a question as to the meaning of the motion, the ramifications of the motion, a point of information can be asked for under Robert's rules. Okay, I'm not clear on that. Well, you can ask the chairman who will answer the question, or the town attorney if he's here, or the manager. Your question will be answered. But that's just answering your question. It's not debate. Up until we adopt the Roberts Rules of Orders that don't pertain to any specific terminology, we didn't have that right, because that's been requested. That's right. That's right, but if we adopt point of uh, information or um, point of order is not included in our rules, are they? I don't remember that they are. No. <coughs> but if we adopt Roberts, and Debbie is our expert on Roberts, but he covers <coughs> point of information and point of order. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so if you have any questions on a motion, uh, well, it's still my opinion to that if it shall be decided without debate, it doesn't give you the right to ask for a point of information, and that that point of information or point of order should be included in the rules. Well, it is included in Robert's rules, which is so important that we mentioned. I can assure you that it is. I hope it's included. Well, I hope. I mean, I hope it would clarify that particular issue. And if it does, fine. Fine. The only other comment I wanted to make about these uh, draft changes is I kind of resented the attorney inserting his opinion whether we should uh, adopt or not adopt some rules. I think that he should give us the facts pertaining to adopting them or not adopting them, but that we don't need the attorney recommending motions or suggestions for the council on the rules. That was my opinion. That's my opinion. Council Carson? Yeah, I, I didn't quite finish the discussion uh, before Doug went on to the next item of Frank's uh, concern about being able to ask for reconsideration. I'm not sure that I understand the purpose of that. I do understand Robert's rules, the purpose of leaving it the way it was. If we were had six counselors and we had a three to three uh, tie vote, the nays would have it only because the tie vote does not carry forward. So therefore, it is the nays. Now, if somebody in who votes yay at the next meeting asks for reconsideration, it's because they know that that fourth counselor is going to be voting their way. Because if the fourth, in, the new counselor were to come and is going to vote nay, it's not going to be asked for reconsideration because it's going to be a nay vote, which it already is. 
I think that that really changes the complexion of it. It, it seems to me that when it's a tie vote and it's three to three, unfortunately, that's sort of the breaks of the game. But if we were to, to change it into Frank's way, I think that we would always be able to change, any time a council was absent, we would be able to change any vote uh, if they wanted to. And if it was a tie. If it was, yeah, but it'll all, if it's a tie. Yeah. And I'm not, sure that, I, I'm not sure that I see the purpose in amending Robert's rules on this particular issue. It is, does not happen that often on this particular council where you don't have that many tie opportunities. Uh, if it's a very important vote, we have almost always said, let us be sure that all the councilors can be there for it, or let's not act on it if all the councilors can be there for it. I really have some concern in amending Robert's rules to, to go for our particular purposes. When I think that they work quite well for our council and for all councils, and I really believe that we've had so few occasions in the nine years that I've been here that, that we've had a tie vote that that we need to go out and get that other council. We almost always, in courtesy to the council, wait for them all to be present. And I and I, and I feel uncomfortable changing Robert's rules. And I and uh, I would like to encourage the council not to do that at this time. If it's for new information, if there happens to be a vote and it happens to be a tie vote, and it happens that new information comes forward, I would hope that the council as a whole would want to see that new information, not just the three councils who really wanted the item to pass. If it's new information, I would hope the council as a whole would want to reconsider to, to receive that new information. So I, I, would, I would ask the council to consider seriously um, Frank's asking that we amend poor old Robert's rules and also this business of the change of heart. You know, our constituents talking to you and being responsive. You've done that on Route 77, bus pass, <laughs> but ask for reconsideration when we unanimously banned parking in the bike way. Yeah. Asked for reconsideration once before when I made a mistake in the vote the council wouldn't even give it to me. They get hard nose one. Yeah, you guys were tough. So you're saying then that if if by any oh, Madam Chairman? Council Latori, do you want an answer? You were you looked as if you were in pain, yeah. I, I'm always in pain when <laughs> Councilor Carson opposes me. <laughs> Deep severe pain. Especially, you especially because, you because she's so eloquent. <laughs> but I, I just I guess I, I can understand what you're saying, but what that makes the law then the absolute law is that if you cannot attend that night for whatever reason too bad. I mean, that, that's just it. And even if you were the, the, the deciding vote the other way, which would sway policy, and certainly we just recently had a tie vote that was very, very critical, uh, you know, which we needed to have a reconsideration on or not, et cetera. You know, so it, it does happen in, in the recent history of the council. But I just feel bad that if a fourth counselor has a strong feeling which is going to sway, which is going to actually make our, the elected representatives go in the positive direction, but because of extenuating circumstances can't get here that night, that's it. That's the breaks of the game, I guess. That's what that law does that I don't like. That's what that rule does that I don't like. I think, well, it happens in the United States government, but maybe they want to be absent. I don't know. Yeah, I, I know. That's true. It does. But, it does I, mean, I, it happens, I see what you're saying. It happens throughout. I think that I would hope that we as a council can work together so that if a, if a vote, we almost always know what the next meeting, I mean, we almost always know some of those controversial votes, what meetings are going to come up. And if councilors know they can't be there, I would hope that they could go to their fellow councilors and say, I absolutely cannot be there. I hope that you would be able to move this on to the following agenda so that we as a full council can act on it. Because I, I just think it's so rare that it happens, but when it does, I would hope the whole council were to participate. If it was a hostile council, it's going to say no. <laughs> but I don't think that we've acted hostily toward each other in the past. Well. Not too often. <laughs> <laughs> Once in a while, but most, most of the time we do cooperate and, and we we treat each other courteously and with respect. And if somebody feels strongly about reconsidering something that's been voted on, I think so. Uh, we're hoping I think to avoid the vote I don't believe until the full council is present. Yeah, yeah. Politics is politics. Well, what about, may I move on to section 17? Uh, this deals with the problem uh, of reconsideration of 
a motion of the same or substantially the same vote at the same or next stated meeting. And the question is, what is the meaning of substantially the same vote? In other words, if a motion is made that's just slightly different, different uh, from the original uh, motion, how do we decide whether it's different or the same? And, and the answer to that, the suggested answer, is that the poor chairperson decides. Like, you sort of get a feeling from everybody, and then... Well, I, I think it's a matter of looking at the language and, and making a determination. And that would not be debatable unless somebody wanted to suspend the rules. Under Roberts, could they challenge the rules against the chair? Yeah. And overrule the chair? Yeah. They could. Madam Chairman, I would say it's a poor chairman. I would say it's the honorable chairman to make that decision. <laughs> <laughs> the person in the hot seat. Any other right. comments on that, Council uh, Latour? I my my feeling is stated in the sentence here that says, in Tom Leahy, our town attorney's opinion, section 17 should be interpreted to read the same or substantially the same. The same. Therefore, he was feeling ambivalent, and that's how I feel. I don't think we have to adopt the language because it's implicit in that, that it should be that, and I don't feel it needs to go in. Boy, did that ever stir the crowd, <laughs> didn't it? You done? That's wrong, that's the No, that, that's, that's what well, I, I mean. I, what I'm trying to do is move this along. I'm just saying that I don't believe that we need the language. I don't, I don't think we need the language. I agree with Frank on that. I think that's fine the way it's hey. <laughs> I don't have a pain. Oh, wow. I don't have a pain. <laughs> uh, do, do we want to have a motion on, do we want to go down each one of these and vote them, or would we suggest doing the whole? One by one. Like one, by one. one by one. Do we, we don't have to take a separate vote one by one. Can't we, oh, kind of, can we agree? And then go through it. Just and then hold on it I think we've got a consensus, pretty much. Now, do we all do we all agree that number five should be? Because I believe number uh, number five should be adopted. Which states yes. that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. I, I okay. skip that one. This is the one where um, uh, in, in the procedure for a, for a member of the public to address the council that. Ordinarily, we don't, once the council begins its deliberations after the public uh, period, uh, no person shall be permitted to address the council. And it's added, except by leave of the chair. And any person desiring to further address the council on such item must wait to do so until all items on the agenda have been completed, except by leave of the chair. That's good. Mm -hmm. We're all for that. Second, consider the first reading. Just for the point of clarification. <laughs> mm -hmm. All this is the first reading. That nice. Okay, well, let's go back to section uh, one, or number, item one, shall be decided to vote today. Is everyone for this one? In my heart, no, but I'm going to vote for it. Uh, everyone for number two? Yes. No. You're not. You are? Yes. Uh, section uh, item three? Mm -hmm. No, I'm, okay. in, I'm in favor of it. Four, we're going along with the attorney's recommendation. We need to have a consensus on item three. Want to take a straw vote? Well, you've got to come up with it somehow since it's the one we debated. This is uh, to allow any member to move for reconsideration of the matter. All those, just as a straw vote, it's not a formal motion, I'm just asking for indication. All those in favor that any member be allowed to move for reconsideration of the matter, not just someone on the prevailing side. Please indicate. I was going to make one more pitch. I just had a good idea. Are you raising your hand, sir? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm in favor. Of just, well, I'm in favor of just for the, in the tie, just for the tie, not the whole, just for the okay. tie. But the rest of us are with the town attorney. So, uh, no, I, no, 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 you have, well, to, you have to ask for the tie. You have to ask for people's consensus on the tie. I'm changing Robert's rules. We're not well, using Robert's rules. Do you want the town attorney to write that up? No, I think you have to ask how the council feels about that. Whether they wish to vote that any member may vote for reconsideration in the case of a tie. Okay, we'll ask that. May I make one last statement, Madam Chairman? I may have to reply. Only. Keep I'm very, very brief. Even, up, even yeah. if even if it is the pros that feel that they have that other pro vote in the bag, mm -hmm. certainly the negatives, the three negatives, can call and lobby and do whatever they wish to do with that person. That person might not, might not be made in casting But they've already won the negatives. Yeah, the negatives, but, but, I'm, saying, but I'm saying that a tie is fair still because even if the positives feel they have a fourth positive vote, the three negative people can still lobby that person tremendously to say, look, why don't you think about voting negative? That keeps it fair, <laughs> it keeps a balance. Well, it really does. All those, all those in favor, Michael. I, not to ponder this, but I've been dealing with something all night long. <laughs> you passed the swearing church thing three to two. This mm -hmm. is not order. It, it needs four <laughs> votes to pass. It did not pass. I've studied the rules. There's no way it can be reconsidered. So what I, I think as long as you're doing this, what you may want to do too, is when, when any item, and you had a quorum present, but you didn't have four votes, not, not only a tie, but when, or when any vote is a, is a is an affirmative vote, but one that four votes are not received, that you could also reconsider. You, you might take care of that technicality at the same time, so that the Sperling Church thing doesn't forever remain in limbo. <laughs> I wonder who done that. Mm. I don't think you can apply rules retroactively. No, no, so that we can take it up sometime down the road a piece. Just run the tape backwards. We should take it up fairly quickly because June is coming on us. Oh. May and June. We still have the rules. The rules that require the refund are not in effect. That's right. Essentially. The old rules are still in effect. So by voting in the minority, we get our way. That's right. Wow. Well, we can. Wow. We can ask okay, so we have an indication on Fred's idea. And as amended by Michael, to get us yeah. out of that dilemma, too. Yeah. Are we, we are now voting on whether to amend Robert's rules. That's right. On the tie only. And I'm not going to vote for it. I'm not going to vote for it. Is this how we're voting now? No. We're going to just, we're gonna just give our opinions. Oh, I thought, this is the I am, am going to vote for it. So we know how to vote for this in the end. Okay, all those who are with Fred on this. That was just a tie vote? On the tie. Just a tie? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a tie. <laughs> no, no, oh, no. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Have it right enough. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now where are we? Number four. Number four. Number four. Number four. Number four. Number four is the same or substantially the same vote, no. adding that language. We're opposed to adding it. You're opposed? Are right. you, Bill? Yes. Everybody's opposed? Yes. I got it. <laughs> I kind of like it. All right, section five. Procedure for addressing counsel. By leave of the chair. Everybody in favor of that? I already voted. Madam Chair. Have we, in effect, tonight given these new changes the first reading? Because I want to be perfectly clear on the rules that we have to follow to change our rules, that we do this tonight, that we start the process tonight. If someone makes what a motion. What is this first reading stuff? That's what we the council rules need two readings. In order for the council rules to be changed. Oh, okay. they need two readings. That's right. Someone ought to make a motion to give those changes their first reading. Don't do that, Doug. Uh, council will turn. Madam Chairman, I move that we give, as just taken in our straw poll vote, those particular changes a first reading. Second. I think I'm good enough. Council Carson. But we've given them the first reading, but it doesn't mean that we. this is the way we're going to vote. When we get to the final vote, anybody may at that point have, for whatever reason, 
change their mind on any of those changes, is that correct? I intend to come oh, armed with Robert himself. Yeah. <laughs> who passed away in 1832. Okay, so we've had the first Moses, reading. Moses anointed Robert. Who is this guy? All those in favor? Oh, the first reading. You have to read them. That's right. We can vote to dispense. Yeah. Dispense. I would have a motion to dispense with the reading. Yeah. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Did you want to read the motion? I don't want to read them. I didn't make the motion. Did you but I yeah, think read them because we don't have them. It has to be. It has to be a unanimous vote. Yeah. Yeah. That was part of the dispense of the reading. It's not possible to read them because there'll be some changes in the language that you can tell So you got to have another reading on it to, to do it. You can't reading. do it. Yeah, a second reading. No, I can't. Yeah. So what was, was I the only one to do? You were the only one. So did you ask who was opposed? Yeah. All of the opposed? The way. No. Do you, if I understand the motion, you want to suspend the rules so you could adopt these with only one reading? No. No, no, no. no. All right, then I misunderstood. Then we, we just don't have to we literally read them. We don't want to literally read them, read them through the microphones uh -huh. right now because we haven't got them set. Okay. All those in favor of the motion? To dispense with the reading. Right. To dispense with the reading. Okay. I'll submit that. And the reason, the, the reason that we dispense with the reading, from my point of view, is because we've discussed them. Not because we don't have them set, but we've discussed them in detail. We all understand them, and hopefully if the public has been following along this incredible and world, we just went down, but... There will be some changes. Right. Okay. Item number 68. To consider acknowledging the receipt of the Municipal Sewer and Riverside Cemetery recommended budget. Michael? Like to I, I, I asked the uh, councilman if I could speak uh, for about five minutes uh, on this particular topic, sort of a, an initial budget presentation, and she thought that the council might be willing to have me do that this evening. So I, I will begin unless I hear an objection. Uh, the town budget uh, being proposed this year for $3.656 million. Uh, that's an increase of 417,000 or 13% over last year. Uh, the municipal budget would require a 50 cent increase on the tax rate from $3 to $3.50. That's a tremendous increase, uh, an awful lot to ask the citizens to come up with uh, this particular year. Uh, I think what's particularly unfortunate about the budget is that we're asking for that much more money with virtually no immediately visible new services being provided. Uh, the 50 cent tax rate, you could easily look at it, 19 cents of it is because of the loss of one revenue that we've been receiving from a buyout of the old regional waste systems by the, by the new regional waste systems. 13 cents is more cost in refuse disposal, and 4 cents is an additional uh, sewer fund contribution. Just those three factors relating uh, to town, really town waste type issues, account for 72% of the increase in the municipal budget. In addition, there's a 14% cost for workers' comp and health insurance. Uh, you add those to the others, that's the 50 cent increase right there. Uh, you know, with, you know, not too much you can point to. I think if any of you have been reading the budgets of all the surrounding communities, Every single community this year is faced with, uh, particularly the municipal budgets, very large tax increases, uh, simply because of many fixed costs. Our county tax taxes are up quite a bit. Uh, it's, it's a very unfortunate situation. Uh, you know, I, I do hope that the council, uh, you know, will recognize uh, that there are these particular needs this year. The school department has concurrently been reviewing their budget. The School board, I believe, was meeting tonight. Uh, the superintendent originally submitted them a budget with a 25 cent increase. Uh, I received a copy of the budget last Friday and, uh, to update the council. After looking at that, discovered that it's actually, it was actually a 63 cent increase and not a 25 cent increase. The 
school board subsequently met last saturday to review the budget and as of then they were going to be recommending a tax increase of a dollar and twenty five cents so between the dollar twenty five and the fifty cent you know you're going to be faced with a tremendous amount of work and really quite a few hard decisions on where you want the budgets to finally end up and what burden you do want to place on taxpayers. The sewer budget is also up quite a bit from last year as a result primarily of the new sewer system going online in October and a full year service of that. In fact, looking at this particular year, just with the revenue coming in from the very high sewer rates that we now have, we're going to have a shortfall of $46,545 on current revenues versus current expenditures. Fortunately, we have a fund balance in the sewer fund that will meet uh, part of that shortfall. The only good news is Riverside Cemetery uh, will have a profitable year. Uh, their revenues will be uh, exceeding uh, their budget uh, by quite a considerable amount. But aside from that, it's going to be an extremely difficult budget year um, and I think an extremely difficult uh, time uh, for the taxpayers of Cape Elizabeth uh, since particularly, I can't speak for the school side, but particularly on the municipal side, so many of the costs are essentially fixed. So I look forward to working uh, with the council in the coming months. Uh, as we review these budgets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for being the bearer of that news. <laughs> Madam, Madam Chair, may I ask yeah, the manager a question? Are you saying that the based on the last school board meeting, the final request, as we, as you understand it, will be for basically a dollar twenty-five cent increase? That was as of last Saturday, when the school board was meeting, and they were having one additional meeting. I believe it's upstairs tonight. So that's the latest that you have on it. Yes. So what you've just said in your scenario is within a matter of weeks, it was first stated a 25 percent, 25 cent increase. Then it went to a 50 cent increase, 63, 63 cent increase, and then it went to a dollar 25. So within a matter of weeks, it was five times the amount of the number that was first floated. I, I, no. I, I guess I, I don't understand. No, I think you know how that could be a part of the process. I, I think you know I could present to the town council a 50 cent increase. You could recommend a dollar 50. Uh, you know, the, the the school board is not at all tied down to the superintendent's recommendation. But his recommendation was 25 cents. It was, but, but it was not, there were some incorrect assumptions about what the tax rate actually was last year in that when in fact it was the 63 cent increase. The, that is, the 63 in essence doubled to a dollar 25, primarily because the school board had a different philosophy on how much of their surplus should be utilized. It, it was essentially there was quite a few other changes in the budget but that was the the one major thing that kicked it up to a uh, dollar 25 so meaning they're, they're willing to use less of the surplus the school board wanted to use much less of it than the superintendent you can handle that we'll get there. Why, why do they have a surplus or expect a surplus this year when last year we had to bail them out for hundred fifty thousand dollars I think if you're you bailed them you you appropriated it. Right? <laughs> I like so your language. I like your way. I, you know, I, I don't I don't remember if it, was a, if it was 150, but you did appropriate additional funds last year in excess of 100,000. Subsequently, after you did that, and in including those funds as well as savings and other accounts, they had a surplus of 300 something thousand, if I remember right, in the audited statements. In addition to that, they've, they've generated surplus funds this year of uh, in excess of 100,000. I don't remember the exact amount. Oh, they projected they were. I'd like to know how they generate surplus. Well, I think you'll have an opportunity to discuss that with them and to review their budget. I'd, I'd much rather they spoke on it than, than me. I just wanted to give you a general flavor before you read it in the newspaper of uh, what, what the total picture is. Madam Chem. Councilor George. I, I have a comment and I would like to ask the manager a question before I get into my spiel. On that sewer fee there, I thought when it was originally set up at the $416, I believe it is, that it was good for three or four years. It was good a, for three or four years. 
for three or four years, and I still hope for it to be good for three or four years because it built out of surplus. The major problem we've run into is that the all of the expenditure assumptions provided for a Portland Water District sewer assessment uh, of about 600,000. The sewer assessment is about 700, 720,000 from the Water District. Okay, so this gives me an opportunity to speak to this members of this council of what's going to happen with your sewer user fee if we don't start and do some rethinking that the people now are paying four hundred sixteen dollars a year that and there's some of them that's paying more than that that to me that sewer business is just like running a business you've got to generate more revenue if you don't the people aren't going to be able to afford it. You're going to be up to $500 a year within the next three or four years, in my estimation, as far as a user fee for the average people, person, or family in this town. And I think that's getting outrageous to tie that sewer to a certain number and let them few people have to pay for it, the use of it. And uh, I don't think the ones that voted for it, as everybody keeps telling me, that they voted in the affirmative on a referendum, that they knew that they were going to be drilled with a $500 sewer bill within five years. And I'll, I'll stand on this table if I don't hit the five years that you'll be $500, $500 on average. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Carson. Could I just ask, um, maybe between, before the, we get to budget, if maybe the manager might ask, is it usual for schools to have large uh, surpluses? I mean, school budgets, I mean, it's part of the budget process. In other communities, is it is it common to have? I mean, we've not had it here in this town before. But is it a common thing? I mean, is it unusual? Or could you... When you come back next time during a budget workshop, could you have found out? I mean, do other communities have ever had budget services like that in school? Maybe you could find out. I mean, I don't know. You know, we're having a meeting tomorrow morning of the Cumberland County Managers Association. I'd be happy to yeah, just, ask just, them. Just not. I mean, not fast. Just ask around. I mean, I, I'm, I'm really concerned about that kind of process, and it may be simply a bookkeeping process. I'm more, I'm more concerned about what happens when there is a surplus. What happens what to happens the money? To Right. I would assume that any department that had a surplus, that that money would revert to the general fund. That, yeah, that is a question. Not school funds, it's a state law that they retain them. Okay. That's a banking system. Well, the surplus can be used to offset an increase in uh, costs. Yeah, but not by us. Only by a school board, right? They can only decide. Well, there's more than one way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, Councilor Carson, I would like to move uh, that the council acknowledge receipt of the municipal sewer and Riverside Cemetery budget, and I recommend that it go to the finance committee. So okay. moved. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Yes. Is there anything else to come before the council? Madam Chairman, as um, chairman of the Finance Committee, I would like to just ask other councilors present. We had the tentative budget schedule, which was included in our packet. If we can nail down maybe some, the, if you notice, dates were given, but times weren't necessarily attached to them. So I'd like to try to nail down some times while we have people here. Maybe we could do that after the meeting. But I, I certainly, before we all leave, want to look at the times to associate with the dates in terms of the budget hearings that we're going to be having. Why don't we do that at our workshop and let our okay. TV people uh -huh. <laughs> If there isn't anything else, uh, Councilor Amber? Just, uh, I guess, a point of clarification. Uh, the item on the Sterling Church, uh, we, we did not have a motion really to carry because we did not have four votes. Uh, does that mean that the rule, present rules regarding the church will continue in existence? Yes. All right. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't leaving them with, with no rules. Thank you.
And the idea is that uh, these rules will come before us again. I don't feel like it. And the new rules will apply. So we have to pass the new rules. Well, that's the new rules. Substantially different. Substantially different. We'll rename, rename the church. <laughs> Just one other point of clarification regarding the ordinance committee. Are we, what, what, is, what is the status now in terms of deciding on Councilor Jordan's, whether he has a conflict of interest or not? Because he can't even call at this point a meeting of the ordinance committee between now. Oh, we, we couldn't have it on the Monday, the next Monday's agenda anyway, but I'm still unclear as to whether we should have taken some action tonight or not, I guess. Because I've been giving it some more some more thinking, and I guess I'm ready to make a decision. I don't know whether other councils want to decide that tonight. So the Ordinance Committee can know what direction they're going in. Whether the Ordinance Committee will consist of one person or two people. It's got to consist of two in order to get a uh, vote back to the council, because you wouldn't even have a majority. But I think that's going to lie with the attorney's opinion on the bill. That's the chairman is a, an ex officio member anyway. So, uh, Not voting. I just believe, I guess, that the, that the town attorney is basically going to say that it is a council decision. And maybe there are other councils who are ready to make the decision tonight. It's, I don't see what else the town attorney is going to add, given the letter that's in there where it basically says that it's a town council decision on close matters. But maybe if, if other councils still want to wait, we can. I don't feel it's the type of thing that's going to influence, that type of business connection that's going to influence Councilor Jordan's vote. I don't see it as a conflict myself. Any more than possibly having the uh, Portland Symphony and us deciding on that, which is also a tenant at the Expo and a potential future tenant for the Expo, had to do with my decision on voting whether or not they could use Fort Williams. There's other, there's other things where it's just far enough out of the reach that I don't think that it's a conflict of interest. So. I would just wanted to bring that up before we adjourn, because it would give the ordinance committee some clear definitions to where they're going. We're talking about Councilor William Jordan, right? Mm -hmm. I don't see there as a conflict either. I know what you're talking about. Um. My only concern, as I expressed earlier, was whether or not your leases are tied up for sufficient time that they're not going to be jeopardized by a negative vote. And if I don't really want to know your business relationship. I don't know. Uh, I think maybe that particular point might be up to Council Jordan himself. Well, unless if he thought that it was going to jeopardize his leases of that land, then he might remove himself from the issue. But if oh, that is not a concern, yeah, if that, that is not a concern to him, that could be an influence. In my, that could be the only influence in my mind. Mm -hmm. I, I have, if you want me to answer that, I have no concern about that. That'd be a good way to get me out of farming. They could pull my lease. I wouldn't have to farm that part anymore. <laughs> I have no concern about it. I don't worry me a bit. I can feel I can make an honest decision without. But I don't want um, somebody to come up to me afterwards and say you had a conflict of interest. That's all I'm, that's the only reason I threw it out. Well, it, it hasn't been brought up yet tonight, but another member of the Ordinance Committee, I would assume, will find the deal of conflict of interest, and it involves employment. 90% of your farmland was on their land, I would have a concern. Well, it isn't. If just a little piece of it that you could live without, or no big deal. That's, those are the type of things that if you know, we really want to put on the table, would influence. But I don't think... It's not the majority of your land, is it? No, no. <coughs> Small part. So I would... Bill, Bill um, I've had a lot of experience with this conflict of interest. And you have to really examine the situation very closely and how you feel about it. And if you feel that there is no conflict of interest truly involved, then that's good enough for me. Me too. I feel there's no conflict. I mean, I, I have no problem. I've been it's thinking a very about this. Thing. And you, 
you have to beware that if somebody accuses you of a conflict, that accusation may invalidate a vote that you take, yeah. that we all take. So that's the, like the danger of the situation. Okay. Okay, well, we're ready to adjourn then. I got just one thing I'd like to bring up. I mean, it's just a kind of a point of information. And i just like to have the council think about it and why I'm bringing it up while TVs are on. Maybe some people might contact you. I had a conversation with another community and they use their agenda just a little bit different than ours. They let anybody that has anything that they want to bring up that's not on the agenda, like citizen discussion. They have it first on the agenda. Uh, so the people don't have to wait until the end of it to bring something up. And they said it has worked very well. But they are, they are specifically told that if it has any connection with an item on the agenda, not to say a word, it's going to be without it. And I think it's something that we ought to think about, and maybe you'll hear from a few people on their opinion. You might get more people to come in because they don't want to wait till the last end. That's all I have. Do we have a motion on the floor? So moved. Second. To adjourn, right? <laughs> right. Second. All those in favor? Just to get back, I hope you get more comments or better comments than I did when I brought up this council. <laughs> Well, that's why I brought it up. I am going to well, we already had this discussion about having citizen discussion before. Unit, we have a new discussion already. Well, then how do we, if we all want it, how do we get it in?